Hello, and welcome to this special event hypothetical brought to you by the Mental Health Professionals Network, MHPN, and it's wonderful to see so many of you logged on for this live activity. Before we get into it, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia, upon which our panel and our participants, all of you, are located. And I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer, and tonight I am joined by an, an outstanding panel of experts who are going to help me explore some of the challenges and the issues that are raised as we work our way through this hypothetical scenario. I'm not going to be able to introduce each of them in depth, and so I do strongly encourage you to go to the MHPN website, uh, go to the landing page for this episode, and have a look at their bios, because they really are a stellar group of people. Over the next hour, I'm going to progressively lay out a scenario, bit by bit. I'm going to ask our panelists to comment uh, as appropriate. But like you, and indeed like in real life, they have no idea what's coming. So they're going to have to think on their feet. I'm going to have to think on my feet. We're all keeping our fingers firmly crossed that the wheels don't fall off. And don't forget that if you want to look at things in full screen mode, you can do so. It gives a slightly better visual experience. But now, let me take you to the fictional Australian state of Windsor to the capital city of Windsor, which is called Elizabeth. It was recently renamed in honor of our dearly departed head of state. And to the edge of the city of Elizabeth, to a suburb called Williamsville. Clearly, the, the people of Windsor are staunch monarchists. I just, uh, I don't fully understand why our current head of state missed out on the naming rights. There's no Charlestown or, or Charlieville or anything like that. But Williamsville is actually the place that we're most interested in. Williamsville is a, a new suburb, really only built in the last 10 to 15 years or so. Not a great amount of infrastructure there, but it does have a thriving primary school. And we're going to be visiting that primary school before too long. Before we do, I would just like to explore briefly uh, how well some of our organizations and our institutions are set up to assist their staff and other people uh, in issues around mental health, the mental health of their staff and so on. Um, Kate, Kate McMahon, you're, you're a, a psychologist specializing in journalism and trauma. You've worked with uh, media organizations across the state of Windsor, across Australia, indeed around the world, working with journalists to um, help them manage their own mental health issues uh, following reporting on difficult events and also helping them to report trauma more sensitively and I want to come on to that in just a minute but let's stick with the first part for the moment in general terms how well do you think media organizations do in terms of looking after the mental health and well-being of their staff they, they presumably have to report some pretty horrible stuff from time to time Absolutely, Mark. Look, the reality is that journalists do cover really gruesome stuff. We're seeing that, well, we'll see it in Williamsville, but also uh, across Gaza and Israel and all the places we're seeing around the world at the moment. And generally speaking, news organisations are very poor at the way they support and train journalists to, to do this work. And often they send young journalists into the field is sort of a bloodletting, if you like. It's like, you know, if you uh, can hack it, then uh, you can deal with the blood and the gore and all that's there, then you can get the job. But uh, basically, news organisations are very poor. Well, and, and it sounds like there's a bit of a cultural issue there, is it? There's a real cultural issue. There's still very much a macho culture. News organisations are changing as younger people who are far more cognizant of mental health issues are coming into the fray. But still there is that overarching, <clears throat> the old hacks, if you like, are still there. And so there is very much that, that tough macho culture still, really, in many news organisations. So they may not even get much support from their peers, from their colleagues. No, that's very true, that there's some colleagues that would just say, tough it up, I dealt with this, so just get over it, what are you whinging about typical Gen X's, Gen Z's, whatever generation we're up to now, uh, just toughen up. 
The most watched news, TV news in the state of Windsor is Windsor News Live at Six on Channel Six. And Channel Six is owned by Murdoch's News Corp. Given what you know about News Corp around the world, um, how do they rank in terms of how well they look after their staff? In terms of looking after their staff generally, I think very well. In terms of mental health support and understanding the issue of trauma exposure, I think quite poorly. Uh, Channel 6 really haven't wanted any external psychoeducation or training or changing their policies or processes. We know that of Channel 6. Um, they're very, very close shop. And so if ABC are doing it or if Channel 9 are doing it, Channel 6 don't want to know about it. So they're really, as far as I'm aware, not very uh, supportive and not very aware in terms of processes and policies, best practice processes and policies for news organisations. No peer okay. support as far as we're aware. Right. All right, well, that may become significant as things unfold. But for now, thank you, Kate. Mick, if I could turn to you, you're a highly experienced police officer. You've worked for decades in uh, the Windsor State Police and in other police forces around uh, Australia. Um, and you've done a whole lot of different roles in that work. From your experience generally, how good do you think police forces are at, um, at recognising and managing mental health issues in their members? Mark, I think the reality of uh, the Williamsville police, like uh, others around the, the nation and around the world, are, are full of law enforcement agents driven to protect the community and provide a safe outcome at, uh, at each stage. We've got systems and uh, frameworks that exist. However, they don't always cater for the uh, the most high risk. They may cater for 70% of people who, who identify and, uh, and can manage both mental health of uh, policing agents but also the clients they deal with but there are always you know a, a portion of police officers that are will always be subject to the the old fallacy that uh, police are bulletproof and they're uh, they're unbreakable well that's actually a myth that I can uh, I can say that hand on heart uh, over my journey uh, that is something we need to change uh, mm. into the future as do a number of other organizations and so like as with Kate and, and the, the world of media cultural change is, is probably quite important. It is, and, uh, and I think we are becoming so much better at identifying the, the pressure points for, for the, uh, the mental health uh, component of policing. Um, however, uh, it's an intense environment that, uh, that people bounce, uh, whether it's first day, last day, or somewhere across the journey, they are going to be impacted. Um, it's, it's having a, an awareness when, how, and uh, and what to connect with to make sure that you uh, your future future proof your own mental health the mental health of your colleagues the mental health of the society i and did who um, we can use to connect i did pick up just perhaps a slight glimmer of hope there do you think things are changing are, uh, are things improving at all in 34 years yes um mm -hmm. but i think there's a, a long long way to go mark there is a long yeah. way to go and uh, and that's organizationally and, and as well as uh, individuals uh, identifying and, and taking actions to uh, to to remedy uh, their own circumstances, but collectively with the community. We're much better at working with the community and our stakeholders and our support, critical support uh, services, but I think there's a long way to go. Sure, sure. All right, thanks very much, Mick. Um, Lynn, Lynn O'Grady, you're a very experienced clinical and educational psychologist. You're also the area school psychologist for the area in which Williamsville Primary sits. Um, let me ask you first of all about the students just as a matter of interest are we doing anything with our students our, our primary school kids to teach them resilience skills or coping skills uh, is, is that on the agenda at all yeah absolutely mark there's a lot of work that's happened in the last 10 20 years probably to really bring mental health resilience well-being whatever the words we might use to describe it into school so it's in, in curriculum in various ways but there's programs 
Um, ideally, it's done as a whole school approach. So you, you're sort of doing it across across the whole school rather than individual kind of um, teachers doing the work and teachers being supported in doing that work. And we understand schools as communities. So really looking at relationships and looking at, at mental health quite broadly. So skills and um, coping is part of that. But we also know that sense of belonging, the care for each other, all of those kinds of um, aspects of a school community are also really important to everyone. I know this is an impossible question, but do you think it works? Does it help? Are we producing more resilient children as a result? Yeah, well, I don't think the research would support that, and particularly after COVID, I, I think there's a lot of questions around that, and we've we've got a whole lot of um, of kind of concerns around school attendance and resilience in children. I think um, schools often are places where a lot of community issues are brought, and schools are kind of expected to do a whole lot of a lot of work around that as well. So I think schools sometimes feel that pressure and do the best they can, but they're also under pressure themselves, and teachers under a lot of pressure as well. So I think I think it's a work in progress. I think it, a bit like Mick, really, it's better than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but still work to be done and, and doing it in ways that are, that are productive and evidence-based is really important. Sure. Well, you mentioned teachers there and uh, look, it strikes me that teaching is becoming more and more difficult. It seems to me they're exposed to more and more pressure and, and more and more difficult parents, dare I say. Um, what about the mental health of teachers? Do they get training, do you think, or adequate support in looking after their own mental health? Yeah, I, th I think more work could be done as well. So I think that often they, they come into schools not necessarily feeling prepared to, to deal with the, the kind of um, work that they are needing to do in terms of children's social emotional um, issues or family issues. I, I think sometimes working with parents is, is the hardest part of um, school staff's job and building those relationships and, and um, respectful ways of communicating and having codes of conduct and all of those kinds of things are work in progress as well. And um, people feeling that they can have a voice but, but do that in a way that's respectful of each other is, is a really important part of that work between teachers and, and parents, mm. all in the interests of the children, having that at the centre, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Lynn. I would like to now introduce us all to the family who are going to become fairly central in our story. It's the Robinson family. Jim and Jody Robinson are in their early 30s, and they have some seven-year-old twins, Shane and Matilda. Uh, Jim is a factory manager. He, he started off on the factory floor, and he gradually worked his way up. He's a pretty, he can be a sort of personable kind of guy, and he's obviously got some skills. Jody works as a hairdresser. She used to work full-time before the kids were born, uh, but she now works a couple of days a week as a hairdresser. Both Jim and... Jody dote on the children and uh, I have to say that they they compete for the children's affections often in a way that some of us might consider to be a touch pathological in fact the whole dynamic of this family is uh, if you'll forgive me for using the term airing on the pathological the relationship between Jim and Jody is very volatile it veers wildly from declarations of undying love for each other to screaming matches of abuse and verbal aggression. We think not physical aggression, but nevertheless, verbal aggression. Um, Jim has a reputation in some quarters as being a good bloke. He's obviously got some interpersonal skills, uh, but in other quarters as being um, uh, aggressive and short-tempered and... Um, yeah, volatile, particularly when he's had a few drinks. So he's, he, he can be quite difficult and he pushes the boundaries a lot in all sorts of areas, both legal and otherwise. Uh, Jody also has a long history of psychological problems, problems in relationship, history of relationship problems, uh, history of perhaps some emotion regulation kind of problems as well. She has in the past had a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Andrew, Andrew Channon, you're a psychiatrist, a very, very experienced psychiatrist. You have a particular interest in um, personality pathology. Um, you also are fortunate enough to be Jody's psychiatrist. Now, let's just put Jody to one side just for a second. What about this diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? Do you think it's a useful diagnosis? Yeah, well, it's a good question, Mark. I think that if you take away the, the word borderline, yes, it is. Um, 
personality disorder is a, a very helpful concept for understanding when somebody's personality development means that they can't form uh, a stable sense of who they are and how other people relate to them. And they have difficulty developing the capacity for intimacy, cooperative relationships, conflict resolution. And really what it describes is a form of developmental problem. Uh, the borderline bit, not so helpful. It's a historical term. Uh, it's laden with a lot of meaning. And really these days, it's just shorthand for the most severe form of personality disorder. There are other forms of personality disorder, of course. Is there, There's presumably some benefit to be had in differentiating them, quite different to, I don't know, avoidance, for example, or... Uh... Actually, no. In fact, one of the things that uh, we've discovered over the last 30 years is that there's really only one personality disorder. It's one thing, and you can okay. describe the flavour of it. It's a bit like you've got ice cream and then you're describing the different flavours. It's all ice cream, though. And I think that's been an important discovery because actually trying to partition these things into different labels has probably done everybody a disservice. And really what we're talking about is what it is to be a person. And Jodie really struggles to uh, understand herself and other people. She has difficulty understanding Jim and how, you know, why he does what he does. And her own life has been really marked by difficulties, particularly since she was about 12 or 13. She was always a, a, a kind of an irritable person when she was younger, but since puberty, she really had difficulty understanding people, understanding their motives, her friendships were up and down, and they really followed the same pattern that her marriage, you know, has, has followed, lots of ups and downs, lots of difficulty managing, but nonetheless, she's been able to have an enduring relationship with Jim, and uh, uh, they have many times when they have very happy times, uh, but the bad times are really bad. I don't want to labour the point too much, but I'm interested also in um, potential gender differences. Now, you're kind of at the cutting edge, and so you know all this stuff, but out there in the in the real world, as it were, mm. do you think there is a tendency to perhaps use a diagnosis, a label of borderline for females where perhaps males might get diagnosed with something like antisocial personality disorder. I'm thinking maybe Jim might even get labelled that at times. Look, there is an element of that. But but actually what, what we know in the community is if you go out and do surveys, uh, actually there really aren't gender differences in these, uh, in personality disorder, particularly the severe forms. Uh, but there are absolutely different um, patterns of help seeking. So Jody's come to see me. Uh, in fact, I know that Jim has never sought help for um, for his problems. And there are absolutely cultural, uh, historical, social reasons why these things present differently. And absolutely in the professions, these terms can be weaponized, uh, particularly by, unfortunately, my peers, uh, who weaponise these terms and often use them pejoratively. Uh, down the road, there's actually a, a large field with uh, uh, tumbleweeds through it, uh, and it's got future site of the uh, uh, Williamstown Hospital, Williamsburg Hospital, uh, and Williamsville, sorry, hospital. Uh, and um, uh, there really are no services uh, around here for, you know, people with severe mental health problems. So, you know, poor old... Jim really wouldn't even stand a chance uh, of finding help anyway. Uh, and so, you know, he gets a bit drunk on Saturday night and, you know, sometimes so gets in trouble. Exactly. Even if he did put his hand up, which is pretty unlikely, it would be very difficult for him to get help. Um, Absolutely. Thank you very much, Andrew. Let, let, me, let me bring you in, May, if I could. May Sue, you're a, a very experienced GP with a particular interest in, in domestic conflict and things like that. You've got the pleasure of being the Robinson family GP. So you know Jody very well. You know the twins very well, Shane and Matilda. You know uh, you know Jim, but as we were just talking about, you don't see him very often. He's a, he's a bloke. He doesn't like going to the GP. He'll avoid it as much as he can. But you do know him, and, and you are his GP. Um, can I just ask briefly, I mean, you heard what Andrew was saying there about the way we might conceptualise personality kind of stuff. Do you agree with what Andrew was saying? Would you go along with that? 
Yeah, I, I'd very much agree with that. Um, as um, some may already know, there's been some changes in our classification from a categorical form of describing personality to more of a dimensional consideration that personality in any form of disorder can sometimes look very different to each person who might assess that and each individual, even in our historical definitions of borderline personality disorder, that could look very different. And it wasn't very reproducible, our ability to effectively be able to determine what categorical form that somebody had a personality disorder. So, so that it wasn't very helpful for us to be able to really move forward using those as definitions. And as, as Andrew said, I, I think it is tricky when we talk about stigma because I think if we don't look at the underlying reasons for why people develop those names in the first place, I think you can just move a stigmatised name from one name to another name. Um, and, and I think the, the new recognition we do have is that personality disorder often really um, is derived from developmental issues and I, I often see them in the context of abuse and trauma and I think that would probably be valid not just for Jodie um, in terms of what might be occurring but also for Jim as well and 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 it's interesting because I think what we do recognise is that the demonstration of how then a person might present into their presentation of how their personality might present itself may both have similar origins but may be expressed very differently sure. and may be expressed at different times in different periods of their life as okay. well. So we, we, we are reluctant to put specific labels on them but we, we can probably agree that there are personality issues for both Jody and Jim, and I'm interested in your thought about, I guess, about the welfare of the children and, and how it might be for the children in this family. And I'm going to just lead you on as well to a, a related question, which is, how do you balance the, the, the benefits of keeping the family together uh, for the benefit of the children versus leaving children in a situation where there's so much conflict and high emotion and, and so on? Is that a balance that you grapple with? Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I might just make one further point, though, that sometimes a person with personality disorder, they don't have a personality disorder throughout the whole of their lifetime. So it's not always longitudinal. So you may find that there's different elements of functionality at different transition points within their life. And this is really interesting because they have seven-year-old twins. And so the perinatal period, the period where they have very young children is a really common period of time where you often see someone who may have been previously functioning suddenly become dysfunctional. So we don't actually have a background for Jody or Jim about what their functioning was like before this happened and what their relationship was like before this actually happened. Okay, okay, fair enough. So, Would you, sorry. Yeah, then I was going to answer your question, which was about <laughs> okay, the, the benefit of them actually staying together as a family unit. Uh, and I guess this is always um, a real concern whenever there's actually children involved, because um, I think um, many of us get very triggered when there are children who are um, involved in the situation. Um, it is a one of those concerns in terms of if you do see children involved about your question about one, whether you might consider mandatory reporting, which um, I think we do increasingly recognise that even if children aren't physically hit, um, that actually just being in a household where there may be um, highly expressed emotion, which I think is what's being described here, can yeah. also have a significant impact. So it'd be what we call an adverse childhood experience. Having said that, it's cumulative. So we know that the number of cumulative adverse childhood experiences is what is likely to contribute to the long-term outcomes for the child, as well as the corollary that we, we were hearing um, uh, in talk about the benefits about what you could do to add resilience. So there is a converse term called positive childhood experiences, that there are factors that you can put into the child and the family's life so this is where you are talking about family supports and services, which may actually be protective and may allow the family unit to still stay together, even in a really difficult situation. Okay, thank you very much, May, um, because this is a really difficult situation. Let me take yeah. you back to the Robinson family now, because all is not well. Unfortunately, uh, 
Last night around midnight, um, the neighbours heard the most horrendous row going on in the uh, Robinson household. Uh, Jody and uh, Jim were screaming at each other. Uh, the neighbours heard the sound of plates or something smashing against the wall. Uh, Jody was was um, uh, screaming out that, that uh, Jim had had an affair and so on. The neighbours are very worried about the children, and about the safety of the children, and so they decide to call the police. They call the police and then they go around to the Robinsons, they bang on the door and they tell uh, Jody and Jim that they've called the police. Mick, you've spent many years in the police. No doubt you've been to the odd domestic or two. What's it like for a police officer to be called to, I guess, break up a fight between husband and wife? It's really interesting. It's uh, the humanity uh, we some uh, touched on before. Uh, every situation police respond to will have an element of humanity that will link to them or their partner or someone in the, in the responding uh, call. So it's um, it's heading into the great unknown. It's heading into a volatile situation that could very quickly turn on the police at the same time when uh, when the uh, the intervention or uh, disruption strategies are discussed, implemented. Um, it's really uh, it, it can take a toll just in the lead up to uh, to attending situations like that where there really is a great unknown. The, the levels of screaming and smashing uh, can be uh, a very short, uh, isolated incident, or it can lead to a catastrophic consequence. So it's a really uh, it's a it's a very very uh, difficult situation to mentally manage. Normally, would you go uh, just police, or would you bring along a social worker or a family worker or? In the first instance, generally, Mark, it would be the police attending. Um, we would, uh, whilst we're on route, we'd be trying to get as much bio data and, uh, and information about the situation as we can. So we'd tap into our systems to see what services have been involved, what policing units have been involved, if they have been, and what we can use from the very first point of contact to leverage some sort of um, uh, compliance with both parties. Uh, and that's the both parties to the exclusion of the children at this stage. Sure. Okay. Well, um, in this case, when the police arrive, Jody has disappeared. Jim doesn't know where she's gone. The attending police officers see the mess. They see the terrible mess in the kitchen and so on. Jim is very calm. Jim, as we say, is a very personable kind of guy. He can turn it on when he needs to. He's very calm and he explains that Jody lost it completely. She just went berserk. She started throwing things around at him. He says that he was very worried. He was very worried about the children uh, and so on. Uh, but now everything looks very calm. Jody's out. She, she's gone. Um, the police assess the situation and they think that, OK, well, it's safe enough to leave the children with Jim and we'll reassess it in the morning. So they leave him there. Um, Andrew, about two o'clock in the morning, you get a, well, Jody leaves a message for you on your voicemail. Uh, she's clearly very agitated. She's very distressed. She says that Jim's thrown her out. Um, she's she's frightened of what he might do. You, of course, have excellent boundaries, and so you don't keep your phone in your bedroom. And it's not until the next morning when you get up a bit before 7 o'clock that you look at your phone and you see the voicemail from Jody. Uh, are you going to do anything at that point? Uh, yeah, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, traditional view of how to manage these things is actually... To, to be a bit at arm's length. But but actually one of the things that works is to be there when things are difficult. Uh, and uh, so actually uh, I did have my phone on overnight um, and I do tell Jodie that uh, she can call me at any stage if she needs to. Uh, well, and yeah. she rang me actually very distressed because, you know, Jim had told her to get out and... Uh, she felt very rejected by him. Uh, she said that, you know, everybody sees me when I'm at my worst. No one ever sees me when I'm at my best. Uh, they don't take any notice. Uh, and actually, um, I said, look, I'll call you, you know, uh, again in the morning and, um, uh, and check in how you're going. Can you go somewhere safe tonight? And she said, I can. I said, are you going to be safe overnight? She said, absolutely, I'll call you again if things get worse. She said, okay. Often I just need time away to help me to settle my emotions uh, and then to regroup. And so she, she did call me. Uh, okay. again in, in the morning, though, you do as you promised and you ring her back, but she's not answering yep. her mobile. I'll go straight through to voicemail. 
She still has not returned home. Jim has tried to ring around, try and find her, can't find her anywhere. Um, he drops the children off at a before school program and then um, he goes to the police station. And whether it's to protect the children or whether it's to just have a go at Jody, it's difficult to tell. But he asks the police to issue a protection order. Now, these things are called different things in different states. But in the state of Windsor, they have something called a temporary protection order that the police can um, grant, as it were, uh, and it has to be reviewed by a court within 72 hours. Jim is so calm and he's so um, logical and so on. He presents so well. The police saw the mess in the house last night. They believe what he says, uh, everything about Jody. So they do issue this temporary protection order that says she must stay away from the children and from the family home until it's reviewed by a court. May the police contact you, first of all, to ask you whether you've seen Jody and you haven't, you haven't heard from her, but also to, um, to tell you about the protection order. Do, what, what's your reaction to that? Um, look, I, I have been in a similar situation before, and this is a really difficult situation because on one token, um, I have been contacted by the police and I need to release information, uh, and, and sorry, they've been requested to release information, but by the same token, I don't have enough information at that point of time to know what information I'm actually allowed to release. Um, and so unless there's a really obvious thing where I'm actually concerned about her actual risk of life, I'm, I'm not actually at liberty to necessarily actually say whether she's actually attended in the practice or not, even no. if it's the police actually saying. So it, it is a really tricky situation. Um, and I, I, I guess the other concern that I have is I'm probably the only GP in um in Williamsville, Williamsville, you are, yeah. Which means that I might actually be the GP, not for just for Jody, but also for the children, and also yeah. for Jim. So yeah, you, are, yeah. you are indeed, you are indeed. So you've got split loyalties, of course, yeah. But anyway, yeah. you don't know where she is. Um, there's not really much you can do, but at least you know now that the protection order is in place. Um, Jody's still not answering her phone, so Jim rings and leaves a message. Some might say a rather gloating message to say that he's put the protection order in place and she has to stay away. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew, how, how do you think she's going to react when she hears that message? Well, I'll let you into a secret. She actually rang me and she hasn't spoken to anybody else. And uh, she's beside herself. She says, they're going to take the kids off me. Uh, you know, Jim does this all the time. He punishes me. Uh and look, the only option I have is um, is to you know kill myself. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time helping her to manage that situation. She can't good, see any way. I, I understand. How good are we generally at predicting behaviour? Could be suicidal, but it could be other violent behaviours. Are we any good at it? Are we good at predicting behaviour? No, we're really lousy, uh, actually, on a group level. Um, and we're pretty lousy uh, with individuals when we kind of try to predict behaviour from someone in an office. However, what we're better at is understanding people, individuals and their stories and knowing how they might respond. And one of the things about Jody is she's been doing this for her whole life uh, and it's it's a bit like she's been dealt a hand of cards that doesn't really contain any very useful cards for living life. Uh, and she plays those cards because they're the ones in her hand. Uh, and you can predict that when these things happen, she will become highly distressed, won't be able to think, and ultimately draw the conclusion that she can see no way out of this and that she thinks that... Um, uh, killing herself is going to be the only way to manage how overwhelmed she feels and how ashamed she feels uh, that she can't uh, look after, as she puts it, look after her family. Well, okay, not a bad prediction, but it's not quite right. So after school <laughs> starts, Jodie turns up at the school. Uh, she goes straight into Shane and Matilda's classroom. She shuts and locks the door behind her. We don't know what's happening in that classroom. 
But what we do know is that a few minutes later, a child, not, not one of the twins, but another child from the class comes out and runs to the principal's office. She's got a handwritten note that she gives to the principal that says, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but I'm not leaving unless I can leave with my children. The principal asks the child several questions. He doesn't really get much further. It seems that everything's in inverted commas calm in there. Jody has uh, told all the children to sit quietly and the teacher to sit and so on. The principal asks um, if asks the child if he think if the, if she thinks that Jody is holding anything. The child says yes, but he couldn't see she couldn't see what it was. He's, she's got something black in her hand. The principal is not coping very well. He's getting extremely agitated. He's really worried. He says, could it be a gun? The child says, well, it might be. The, the, the principal starts to push her and says, well, was it a gun? Was it a gun? And the child says, well, uh, yeah, I, th I, think it, I think it might be a gun. Lynn, you're in the school today. Um, the principal has called you in. He explains the situation uh, and he asks your advice. What do you suggest he does? Well, this is a pretty unusual situation for a principal and I can appreciate how... Um distressing it would be and having to make decisions around what to do. I, th I think um, the police need to be called. I think that's outside of the scope of the principal to to handle this really and particularly if he does has formed that opinion that there's a gun. So I, th I think it is a phone call to the police well, and for the, our that, emergency that, management process in the school as well, calling together exactly, some people, that, leadership that's team. Good, and good advice. So he does call the police. He calls the police and uh, he tells them what's happened and he tells them that the, the child who's come out says that she's got a gun. Um, he's also very overwhelmed. He's, it, it, how much do you think it's important to look after him to, to deal with his kind of... Yeah, I, mean, I think that is really important. And, that, and I think the idea of, of calling together, let's get some leadership, the other leadership people in here, it's a pretty small school, but we do have emergency management processes. So I think um, calling in, you know, trusted... Um, colleagues who who form that that team and to say well this is an emergency situation let's get get the team together let's let's you know call the police and effectively put things in place I, I think and um, get some things in place and then keep sort of working through a process I think is important uh, but certainly yes. for him is important yeah support him in, in yeah helping him to kind of make some sense of yeah well now um a parent was standing in the corridor outside the principal's office mm -hmm. while all this went down the parent has heard what the child said to the principal the parent has heard the principal um making the phone call to the police the parents at williamsville primary have a facebook group that they talk to each other on they also actually have a whatsapp group and they have an Instagram group, and they have a group on that thing that used to be known as Twitter. So <laughs> in a matter of minutes, this story has gone viral. It is right all over the place with all the inaccuracies and exaggerations that you might expect for a story like this. Mick, the principal has called you. He's told you that this is going off. Um, Windsor Police, call the Windsor Police Force. They've put it through to your unit the uh, Special Response Unit, also known as the Windsor Task Force or the WTF. Um, that was a bad joke, really. I shouldn't have bothered with that one. Really. <laughs> we'll call it the Windsor Special Response Unit. The bottom line is, Mick, it's come through to you. This incident is now your responsibility. Um, the principal has told you that the child has said that Jody has a gun. Are you going to take that seriously? We'll certainly take it seriously, Mark, but we need to strip everything back and work the facts are what we have as uh, intelligence sources and how we can validate what the, uh, the student has said and, uh, and what our response is going to be. Bearing in mind, we now have a very live situation that we need to control the flow of information so that we don't have hysteria breaking beyond a, uh, an environment that we can control, which it appears as though it has. So we, we need to get on top of this on a number of different levels. We need to respond to that school and provide the principal, the, uh, the staff and the students uh, a protective environment. And uh, bearing in mind, uh, let's validate what we've got. So what do we know versus uh, what uh, has been reported to the principal um, and uh, and what we can use as a, uh, a platform to disrupt the activities in that classroom uh, 
to the exclusion of physical and emotional trauma. At this point, would you be calling up the armed response unit? Certainly be notifying them. We would yeah. notify local uh, a potential uh, armed situation at a school um, that's gathering uh, significant interest within the community. Um, the frontline responders would be there, uh, would, would be responding to, to get as much detail to, to isolate the incident and then uh, we'll work through what we've got and what we need to do from the professional side of things with the experts in, uh, you, in that um, type of arrangement. You talk about isolating things. Uh, would you try and prevent people coming onto the school grounds? Absolutely. We, were, we would try and isolate that area where, uh, where mum's got the, uh, the classroom locked down with the children. We need to work out uh, her mental state um, and uh, what her intentions are, what her triggers may be. Uh, so we've got overt and covert uh, capabilities that we have to think about here, Mark, to, uh, to make sure that firstly, um, is Jim going to be aware of this? And if he's on them platforms that we spoke about, he probably is, and he's going to have a hell of a lot of emotion coming into this without uh, any fact and basis behind it. So we've got a real boiling pot here to deal with. You have indeed, Mick. Um, we'll hear about Jim in just a second because, um, but but you you know you, we're right that that of course it's gone viral. So of course there's a whole ho uh, host of uh, parents and interested onlookers gathering outside the gates. Um, they've uh, put a couple of burly rugby playing teachers on the gates to stop people coming in. They're very well known rugby players from the state women's rugby team. And they're doing a fantastic job at stopping people coming in. Um, Kate, this uh, is something presumably that the media will be onto in a flash. Um, what, 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 are they, what are they likely to do? Are they going to send crews out there? Absolutely. Look, if it's on Insta or whatever, you know, all of those sorts of platforms, the journos will be across it. There'll be people that will be tracking what's going on. Uh, journos will be sent out probably for something like this, but it'll be whoever is available. Um, but I do know that newsroom is a fairly new newsroom uh, in that, that town and uh, they're fairly young journos that are going out there. So uh, they'll be deployed very quickly. They're young journos, but they've also sent um, the television crews. They've sent the van with the thingy jigs on top and so on. Uh, so indeed, in fact, you're right. But within, within a matter of minutes, there's a huge contingent of media outside the gate. Television crews, radio, print media and so on. Um, we've been focusing a lot on, on um, the mental health. Or we were, I was talking to you before about the mental health of the journalists. But... Uh, let's think about this other side about how they might be able to report this incident in a sensitive kind of a way. Lachlan Murdoch, as you know, is the new CEO of News Corp. He's decided to stamp his mark on the organization and he's told his editors to be as sensationalist as possible. In fact, he has told them he wants them to outfox Fox News. With that kind of editorial guidance, how easy is it going to be for the journalists to, to take account of people's well-being? Really hard, Mark, <laughs> which is uh, this is a problem of uh, the young journos in this newsroom are finding it. They've come into, there's a couple of journos I know. One of the young journos got there because I'm a friend of her mum uh, and she really is a young person that really wants to uh, tell the world about really important things and and try and change the world in a in a very positive way, and she's been really struggling with what she talks about the the challenges, the moral challenges in the newsroom where she wants to tell the truth and she feels that Murdoch unfortunately is is trying to put spin and that becomes a quite a distressing place for her. But she's young and she needs to stay there. Look, they will be probably focusing on it. The crazy mother sort of story. They'll be. I know this. This news organisation tends to put that sort of spin. Um, they'll be really highlighting any potential violence. And unfortunately, until whatever pans out, it will be very much that reactive type of journalism. Yes. Okay. And a rapidly evolving situation is going to be very difficult for them. Um, Mick was right. 
that um, Jim, of course, has heard about this on, on social media. So he's arrived at the school gates. He's very agitated. He's demanding to be let in. He's making these threats about what he'll do if, if Jody hurts the children at all. At this stage, the gatekeepers are managing to keep him out, but he's very agitated. Something needs to be done. Lynn, you're the only mental health professional on the site at the moment. Will you go and talk to him, try and calm him down? I think I'd be wanting to um, get some guidance from the police. So it's an active situation and the police are, are really in charge. So I think it's um, it's really talking to the police about how they are wanting us, what roles they want us to play while it's such an active live scenario. So I'd, I'd be, um, be tempted not to do that, I think. I'd, I'd be wanting to really be working behind the scenes, I think, harnessing support around the principal and getting some things in place, knowing that there's there's a lot of work that will need to happen. And while the police are in charge of the active scenario, we take guidance from them. And if they wanted that to happen, then that would be a conversation we'd have with police. So I'd, I wouldn't want to be interfering and, and sort of stepping where it Absolutely. may make things worse. Mick is just about to arrive on the scene. Luckily, he was in the area, so he's just about to arrive on the scene. He's not there yet, though. You're going to leave these teachers to manage Jim on their own, are you? Oh, well, I, I maybe go and have a, have a bit of a behind-the-scenes look, but the teachers probably know Jim, so who would be the person that has a relationship with Jim? So that might be something to think about, who, who has a good relationship with Jim, and it's probably not me, and bring your psychologist in doesn't always you know, sort of makes sense to people. So maybe it is as talking to the principal around while the police are on their way, you know, is there someone that, that does know Jim well that Jim would trust? So that, that could be part of the conversation if the police aren't quite there yet, for sure. Well, that's a very good point. Actually, there is a teacher that Jim knows very well and, and trusts. And so this teacher, the male teacher comes out, talks to Jim and actually does a very good job of calming him down. And rightly or wrongly, you consult with your colleagues and so on. As I say, Mick hasn't quite arrived yet. But you decide that Jim's going to be more easy to manage inside the gates than he is outside the gates. And so you say that he can come in, provided that he sits in the principal's office, doesn't move. Uh, and uh, if he does move, then you'll get the police to arrest him. Um, Mick, you've arrived at the scene. So um, I'm just interested in a bit of a, a diversion that, that I'm guessing that more often than not, if it's a situation something like this, it's more likely to be a male perpetrator than a female. And I'm wondering whether or not you would react differently in in, um, in this scenario, whether it's a female or a male. Look, with armed offenders, the uh, the stakes are high at the highest level, whether it's male or female. So we have to take uh, precautions regardless of um, gender. So we would look at this uh, pretty practically and say that uh, we've got a potentially armed offender in a uh, isolated in a room full of children or uh, young young children. Um, we need to isolate both parents. We need to get police in contact with Jim and we need to establish um, a safe room for him to be in so that he cannot penetrate into that room and cause a situation that's going to be potentially lethal. Absolutely. Do you try to establish communication with Jodie? Would you try ringing her on a mobile, for example, to talk to her? Potentially, yes. We'd get a negotiator at that stage. We've got access to negotiators within the, uh, the special unit. And uh, what we would like to do before we do that is to find out uh, at, uh, what will make Jodie respond to anything firstly the police are going to do uh, does she have a healthy relationship with the police does she have a respectful relationship with the police the primary focus right here is to reduce jody's um, intent or her agitation or her levels of um of uh, reaction that will flow into a, 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 a an incident we can't control in that uh, that room so absolutely we, yeah yeah. OK. Um, I'm just interested in whether you because you talked before about wanting to I mean, I'm putting words into your mouth, really, but wanting to know whether she really does have a gun. Um, if you get through to her on the mobile, would you ask her? Yes, yes, potentially in the right way. We would, And that's that's uh, that's engaging with her in a manner that's uh, not threatening, not directing that she has a gun, but asking what the situation is and, and getting as much information from her. Um, but also, we, we may have security cameras. We may have uh, we may have teachers on site. There may be an adult in the room. There may be some other uh, mechanism that we can use to see uh, her state, her possession of any weapons. Look, it's it's um, tricky. She 
Well, actually, let me tell you, she, you do get through to it. You do ask her. There's a long pause. And then she says, that's for me to know and you to find out. There's not much help. Someone's phone's ringing, is it? Or is that my imagination? Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's for me to know and you to find out. So that's not much help. Um, but while you're considering what to do, um, Jody's, one of Jody's good friends has approached Lynn and says that she knows Jody's psychiatrist and her GP. You were talking about getting some more information, Mick. Would you like to talk to May or Andrew? Get some more information? We're having a bit of trouble with your um, internet, unfortunately, but if, did you get that question? No, if you could go again, Mark, I was just saying, sending a message through to say that everyone, everyone had frozen then, so I do apologise. Uh, I think the problem is your end, but I might be wrong. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, the question, yeah, the point was that, that um, a friend of Jodie's has spoken to Lynn and said that she knows Jodie's psychiatrist and GP. And she and Lynn gives you their contact details. Would you want to talk to them? Absolutely, absolutely. We need to get as much detail about Jody as we can, and uh, and certainly to ascertain the uh, the veracity of what has been put to us. So absolutely. Okay, so um, I'll come back to you, May, because you raised this before. Um, the first person of the two they get onto is you, May. It's very difficult to get through to talk to a GP, but it's practically impossible to get through to talk to a psychiatrist. So they get through to you a bit faster. Can yeah. I bring you, bring you back to that question? Because the situation has now developed. Will That's you, right. Will you give information to the police without Jodie and Jim's permission? Yeah, so this, this is a different situation because we're really talking about a risk of life and there's a clear potential risk of life. So I think that's where we are able to actually be able to say. And generally when we do discuss confidentiality with patients, I think it's really helpful to let them know in advance that this will be the one situation where we may have a breach of confidentiality. Um, so I think in that circumstance, your priority is just trying to ensure that the family is going to be safe and working out what might be going on. And certainly my thoughts, which would be going on knowing Jodie, would be that she sounds really scared. She sounds probably really scared that, you know, the kids are going to be taken away and this is her opportunity, like this is her only chance to keep the children. Um, it, it certainly sounds that what the concern would be is that this is probably an escalation in the interactions which may have been occurring between her and Jim, and it's never gotten to this point before but I'm also aware that in the past Jodie's had a lot of difficulty when she's been in a really emotional state and so it may also mean that it's really hard for her to work her way out of the state at this point and that she may need a lot of support to come out of that like her emotions are probably really heightened she she might be dissociating which is a term where she she's not even really quite aware of what's actually happening anymore um, she, she may um, not have good control of how to regulate her emotions because she's so wound up. And I imagine the increasing escalation of the, system, of the, of the situation with the police involvement, you know, there's probably a lot of noise and a lot of excitement which is happening and there are children involved is probably exacerbating all of this right sure. at the moment. Yeah. Is this um, kind of stuff going to be useful for Mick, this background that you're getting from her GP, from May? I, yeah. I'm not sure if I can re see Mick's response there. but um, I, think, I, 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 think, I had to lip read, but I think he said yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 Absolutely. I probably, okay. I'll probably continue on to also give some information about what Jody has found helpful when she's been in a really stressful situation to help her calm down and to remind her about that and also to offer if that was going to be the situation there might be some safe situations or safe people or safe circumstances which may help in this circumstance sure this is all useful stuff mick would you like may to attend the scene would you like her to come to the site I can get a police officer down to to May to 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 communicate with May and relay that to us and the teams that'll be uh, performing the uh, the in accord and the the immediate actions that may resolve this situation. So she doesn't have to come to the site. No. 
No. No, okay. if, uh, we, we, if she believed that that was one thing that would trigger a withdrawal um, and maybe a resolution, we would consider getting the dam. But no, we're only putting someone else in a, uh, in a situation that if it's an armed offender who has no control of their own emotions. I might make the comment uh, here. Sorry, Mick. Yes, go on, May. I might make the comment here that there certainly have been circumstances in the past where I've actually been involved on the phone for de-escalation. And so that's actually been something which has been helpful where you might actually have somebody, because it's very different when you've got someone who's a trusted individual, um, which I think Andrew really alluded to that when, you know, Jodie was in a really tight spot, you know, this this was the person she called to. So I'm not sure in this circumstance whether it be Andrew or whether it be me. I mean, if I'm the one who's easier to contact and she's got a good relationship with me, which hopefully she does, it might be me, where even if I'm not there in person, like even just having someone on a speakerphone that she trusts, that she feels comfortable with, might actually be something to help bring down the situation. Um, I'll, having, I'll, I'll, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm going to talk to Andrew about that in a little while. But first of mm. all, you've got a more urgent thing because Jim gets through to you. Jim is contained in the principal office. He's doing what he's told, but he doesn't like it. He gets through to you and he says that he knows that if he could go and talk to Jodie, he could persuade her to come out. And Jim is quite calm and he sounds very calm and so on. He wants you to talk to the police and, and, and tell them to let him out and go and talk to Jodie. I'm guessing you're not going to do that, or would you do that? Look, look, my my suggestion would be no, um, because they've already had a background where their their their, their interactions have escalated each other. Um, that I, I would empathise with the difficult situation and the safety, but that my advice would be not to in this circumstance. Um, they, they're not in a circumstance where they've had safe interactions together in a potentially volatile situation, that wouldn't be the timing where I'd suggest that that would be a, a time where they'd test that out. Okay. Um, mm. All right. Thanks, May. Well, look, the situation in the classroom seems to be relatively stable. So another teacher has been able to see a little bit through the window. It appears that all the children are sitting quietly. Nobody looks hugely distressed. The most distressed person looks to be the teacher who is a young first year um, male teacher, only a few months in. He was very nervous even before he started teaching, as indeed I would be. But anyway, he's very nervous and looks like Jody has told him to sit on the floor against the wall opposite the door. She has her back to the door, so we can't really see too much. It does seem that she's holding something, but we can't see exactly what it is. Uh, Mick, you've been talking to Jodie on the mobile. She's asked if she can talk to Andrew. Would you allow her to talk to Andrew? I'm afraid we've lost you, Mick. So Mark, is that, uh, Mark are you, I've just come back in there. I think your question then was, would you allow Jim to talk to... No, no. So we've now moved on. And, and Jodie has asked you if she can talk to Andrew. Are you going to allow her to talk straight to Andrew or do you want things to come through you? Uh, I'd like a, uh, a police officer with Andrew, but if a critical situation here, we've got a, uh, a female potentially armed, a room full of children. We need to get things done. And if Andrew is a person who can influence uh, a resolution, we would uh, we would do that. We'd have a police officer there from the, uh, the special unit that could uh, control any immediate actions that we need to take should things go to an escalation that is... Uh, is potentially um, serious consequence to parties involved. Okay. Um, Jody does get on to you, Andrew. She gets on to you to talk to you. She's still distressed, but she's not quite as bad as you might have expected her to be. Um, is there anything particular that you'd be saying to her, knowing the situation? That, what kinds of things would you be saying? Uh, well, you know, I... I would have hoped to have had a chat to Mick beforehand. That would have been my preference. You know, he's mm -hmm. the expert, armed, potentially armed uh, situations. And I think it would have been helpful for us to have a discussion about what I know about Jody and how not to keep pouring petrol on the fire. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that it really needs to be a team effort. And while I, I have actually spoken to 
uh, a number of patients over the years in these situations. Uh, and in fact, I've spoken to Jody in difficult situations before. This is by far the worst. Uh, mm. And look, she's actually managed them before. So I would be, um, I would be actually uh, talking to her about what's really going on for her. If she rang me and you know I had the opportunity, I would. I think I would be remiss not to actually ask her what's going on. I'd have to gauge whether I was making things worse. But actually, Jody's been underestimated for years uh, because actually she's done a lot of work with me over the years. She's actually done very well in treatment. Uh, you know, situations not as dramatic as this, but actually uh, difficult situations for her used to happen all the time when I first met her, multiple times a week. A week the police were called to the home. And nowadays these things are actually pretty infrequent but uh, or relatively infrequent, but uh, she's actually developed some skills and done well in treatment to actually be able to learn to begin to manage uh, situations uh, less difficult than this. But this is this will be you know this is the most difficult one she's uh, she's wound up in. You have some very special skills, Andrew, because she does calm down a lot while you're talking to her, and she agrees to a compromise and she says, "I'll tell you what I'll do." Andrew, I'll come out peacefully if I can leave with my children and take them to my mother's. Now, you know her mother. Her mother is a very stable, sensible kind of person. who's a great support for her. Um, she lives in the country about 150 kilometers outside uh, Williamsville. On the other hand, you think it's probably not going to be possible because of what she's done so far and there is a protection order in place. Would you bend the truth? You've got a classroom of kids there potentially held up with a gun. Would you tell Jody that, yes, okay, we'll, we'll sort that, or would you stick to the truth? So normally I would stick to the truth, but I wouldn't actually go straight to the bitter facts. Uh, I, I would actually work with the information I have, and Jody and I have had a lot of discussions over the years, and, and we're quite fond of saying that, you know, when you're in a hole, you need to stop digging. And... So actually, uh, I would be talking with her about how deep a hole is this and how, you know, do you think we can work together to stop digging deeper and help you maybe to get out of the hole? And so we would start thinking through the possibilities and I wouldn't promise anything that I couldn't deliver and I certainly wouldn't uh, lie about the difficulty of the situation. I wouldn't add any new information that she didn't know. Uh, that would make things more difficult. But I would actually put to her, what about if I actually had a chat to Mick and uh, asked him what the possibilities are here? Because I'm not in charge here. Mick is in charge. This is uh, a, a potentially really serious situation. And actually, Mick's the person who needs to make these decisions. I'm not the, uh, I'm not the main person here. Good. But good, I, good I'm advice. there and I would be her advocate to try and get the best outcome for her. Um, so you do talk to Mick. You explain the situation. You explain what Jody has offered. Mick, what about you? Would you? You've got a classroom of kids in there, potentially held up with a gun. Are you going to bend the truth? Are you going to tell Jody, "Yeah, we can do that. We can get you and the kids up to your mother's." Bend the truth, or will you be honest as well? Mark, we have to float to the as close to the truth as we can because if a lie is established, if we are, our trust is disconnected in the early stages and we don't have control of the room and the children, then that could lead to a catastrophic outcome. So we need to we need to be truthful. Matter okay, of fact, good. go on. And, uh, and deal with what we've got, working to isolate Jody and have them conversations about what can and can't happen absent of the children. Okay, good. So even though it might prolong it a bit, you're not going to, um, well, you're not going to betray her trust, I guess. Kate, let me let me bring you in here, Kate, because a young female reporter, not the one that you know, this is a, a young, very inexperienced reporter on the scene. She rings you for advice because she's been told by her editor that she has to find some crying, frightened mothers and interview them on camera. And she's a bit uncomfortable with it. What should she do? What are you going to advise her to do? I would tell her that this is a really important story because the journal journalism in this type of situation can be a real conduit for for 
information for the community. There might be families out there that don't know what's going on or whatever, that, that this is a really important role, that as long as she is ethical, as long as she asks permission, if she goes up to someone who's, who's distressed, but as long as she declares who she is um, and asks for permission to interview... Then... So I was going to say, I mean, are we really thinking that that's informed consent? Are you comfortable that's informed consent on the part of the mother? Yeah, I look into. Yeah, absolutely. I always, when journalists say to me, you know, when does informed consent not operate? I usually say, if you've been ethical, if you've been uh, thoughtful and transparent, if the person is dissociative, then that's not informed consent because the person's not there. They're caught up in their own trauma and their own situation, so they can't give informed consent if someone's dissociative. But if someone is is you know not not lights on no one home sort of thing and they are thoughtful and and ethical and ask permission absolutely Absolutely. okay i reckon that's a thin line but anyway we'll we'll see how it pans out kate we'll see how it pans out anyway the bottom line is that mick and his expert team of negotiators with some fantastic help from lynn from may from andrew have managed to do a great job. Uh, Jody tells Mick that she will come out. The incident has lasted around 90 minutes, about an hour and a half. She comes out of the classroom. She doesn't seem to be carrying anything. She empties her pockets. She puts her phone, which has a black case, on the ground. She puts her hand up. Mick, what happens then? She'd be uh, taken into custody. She's uh, There's been an incident where she's held... Uh, ch- there's, there's criminality involved here. Um, so you're, we have to you're deal going, with that. You're going to arrest her. Uh, at this stage, Mark, we've got uh, there's there's grounds to arrest her, but it's also it's a way for us to control the situation. Um, she'll uh, we would we would seek her compliance right through to the uh, and anonymity from the media, uh, from the prying eyes, and uh, and explain the situations. But uh, we've got a number of situations to deal with here none less important than her mental situation um, because we will even even under arrest we're going to seek the guidance of uh of forensic medical officers from the outset okay so you're going to try and persuade her to come with you without having to arrest her at this point she'll come back to the station with you is that right she'll be placed under arrest mark in the uh, in the uh, williamsville uh, yeah absolutely okay so um, she is placed under arrest. So the, the children go home with Jim. They're obviously pretty distressed by what's happened. They go home with Jim. Jodie is taken to the station, uh, interviewed. She's held overnight to appear in court the next morning. Um, May and Andrew, I'm just interested in what you're going to do now. You've got a huge bunch of patients been queuing up while, while this has been happening. Do you have any um, sort of tactics to psychologically emotionally reset after what has been a pretty difficult kind of experience and you've now got to give all your attention to your patient who's sitting in front of you do I of you su- want to suggest how you would go about doing that well uh, may if you'd like to start I'm or I'm happy to go uh, I, look I yeah. think that would you like to start no, no, no you, you go Andrew yes you go Andrew yeah Good, good training helps you to manage these situations. Uh, and actually, um, these situations are upsetting for everybody and it's hard to watch someone you care about and have cared for for some time go through a difficult situation. But also it's important to recognise uh, that uh, despite your best efforts, people make decisions uh, that... Um, make their lives worse, Uh, and that as long as you haven't contributed to making that situation worse, uh, I think it's, um, you know, you can uh, look at your own efforts uh, and think that you have done the best that you could, that you had clearly thought through before what you would do uh, in these situations because you trained for those sorts of things, Uh, and that uh, actually... um, there is a, a principle called dignity of risk that people need to be allowed enough freedom to uh, mm. to be able to make decisions about their life, even if they're lousy mm. decisions. And okay. if you work, particularly in the field of personality disorder, you'd need to get used to the idea 
that people have the freedom to make bad decisions about their life and that you can help them to think through that and prevent that in the future. Okay. So I, All very I, well. I move from that situation to the next one. Uh, it doesn't stop me feeling upset about, for, you know, for Jody, um, but I, I, you know, got on with my day's work. Okay, so you refocus on the patient in front of you. Uh, May, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, look, I, I'd make a comment. I'd have to take a deep breath myself, I think, Andrew, as well. Um, well, I, I do appreciate, I think, as medical professionals, I mean, often we, we do end up in emergency situations. I would probably say that this would really count as high up there in terms of the emergency situations we'd ever manage. Um, mm. It's definitely not a common day occurrence, um, even for those of us who do work with personality disorder and with trauma and abuse and violence. So um, I, I would probably comment that this would be probably on the pointy yeah. end of what we would normally manage. Having said that, um, as Andrew said, that there are some processes about how most practices do manage emergency situations, and that stems from how you might manage on an individual sense, which looks at, I guess, our own personal acknowledgement that this was upsetting, this was distressing, we are concerned for the person who is involved, the family who is involved, plus I'm probably also looking after a lot of the members of the school as well and I'm probably getting people coming in and telling me, did you hear what actually happened as I'm also dealing with it at the same time and it's a small community. So, you know, I am probably looking after the whole community who are all involved with that at the same time. So, so there, there's elements of that plus also my staff within the practice who also know Jody, who also know Jim, who also know the children and the yeah. other children who are going to be involved. So there, there's those aspects as well as the practical elements of the fact that, you know, how do you reschedule and restructure and recognising as well that there will be ongoing repercussions for the family, medical, legally and ongoing care, which is going to happen as well. Okay. So you're both going to be, well, everybody's going to be pretty tired by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, Jodie is going to the magistrate's court in the morning. Her lawyers are going to ask for bail. Will you oppose bail, Mick? Yes, in line with uh, the need for medical intervention and uh, support so that we're not, uh, you know, we're dealing with flow-on consequences should they uh, arise. So we'll, 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 we'll oppose bail. Just uh, very briefly, May, Jodie's got no history of violence. You know, she's very remorseful and so on. You don't think she's a risk in terms of her own mental health and the mental health for children. Will you support her bail application? Yeah, look, I guess if I needed to write a medical legal report, because that's exactly what's being asked here. Um, she's possibly got a solicitor or legal aid, I guess, at some no, point. She's got, she's got legal aid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so I would ask them to actually um, give some advice about what exactly they're requesting me to write in a medical legal report. And then in a medical legal report, I can really just write what my observations are of my experience of caring for Jody would be. Um, and so while she hasn't had a previous history of violence, this event, as a standard own event, is, is, is what we're noticing, as well as the pattern of interactions which have happened previous to this. You're sitting on the fence there, May. Give me a yes or no. Are you going to support her bail or not? Um, I'd support her. One, you'd be doing an assessment to actually confirm where her current state is at the moment, bearing in mind that risk assessment varies at every single moment. And the fact she got to this point makes you wonder what are the factors which got her to this point and what's going to stop her getting to this point again. So I, I can't answer yes or no because we actually haven't done a reassessment to work out what's actually going on. And it's, still, and it's still bearing that whole question that Jim's actually said, I'm, I'm going to potentially take your rights away from the kids. And if that's actually her precipitant for why she presented to this in the first place, if that's not resolved, I don't think we've kind of quite resolved what her next interactions are going to be. Okay. Andrew, just in one sentence or two at most, are you going to support her bail application? Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, what I would do is it's not up to me to decide uh, her future risk. Now, I'm her private psychiatrist. 
Uh, and actually, I would request a letter from her uh, lawyer asking me what they're requesting in the report. I'd ask for her consent uh, to write that. Uh, and, and perhaps it might just be a brief letter at this stage. Um, but from my point of view, uh, I have no reason to oppose uh, her bail. I would be there supporting her. If there is a, a question about future risk of violence, I would say the court need to obtain an independent psychiatric assessment of her risk, notwithstanding the fact that um, we're not very good at uh, predicting future risk, but violence risk assessment is a, uh, is a science to some extent, uh, and there are plenty of people who would be willing to put their kids through school by seeing her. So uh, <laughs> we would, um, okay. there would Fair be enough. no shortage of people available. Fair enough. Uh, Lynn, just in one sentence, it's not going to be very good for the kids if mum goes to spend her time on remand. Would you support her bail application? Uh, I think it would be, be pretty hard, I think, um, to know without all the other um, advice from other professionals. So I think I'd be deferring. I, I think I wouldn't really have enough information to know that. And I think um, mum getting the net support she needs is what would be best for the kids as well and, and their um, safety. There'd be a fair bit of work around um, family, I think, in terms of how the kids are seeing the mum and what's happened and and supporting the family more broadly, I think. So I think it's a bigger, bigger much bigger question that, than I wanted to be sort of getting involved okay. in at that time. Well, next morning, Jodie, sorry, May, did you want to say something? I can't hear you. But Mark, I'd probably make the comment, though, we're not really being asked as professionals to actually support her bowel assessment or not. We're actually just being asked to write a medical legal report. So I, I hear what you're saying, but we have to remember what we're actually being asked to in our professional role as well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the system is such that she has to go to court the next morning. You don't really have a lot of time to be bringing in experts and so on. The magistrate is initially very reluctant to give her bail, given that the fact the police are opposing bail, um, the circumstances of what happened, she is not keen. But the magistrate is herself a mother of young children. She knows what it's like to feel really stressed. She's got some reports from May and, some, uh, and from Andrew and, and so on maybe not as clear cut as she would like but they're but they're okay so she decides she will grant bail with strict conditions so uh, jody has to be released into the care of her mother she has to spend uh, she has to go with her mother up to the country she's not allowed to see the children until the protection order is reviewed which of course is going to be the next day so it's only another 24 hours or so um, but I'm afraid that's the way it is, Mick. Some you win, some you lose. And my guess is that judges and magistrates don't always agree with the police. And in fact, um, the state of Windsor is particularly lenient about such things, uh, at least at the moment. Uh, that is until the next state election when both parties will struggle to outdo each other to prove how tough they are on law and order, because that's a pretty good vote winner. So mum, uh, Jody is released into the care of her mother. She, she's whisked away up the country. And things have developed, have ended relatively peacefully, I think we'd have to say. Uh, I don't want to minimise it, though. There's a whole number of populations that might be affected. Um, the school community, of course, the students, the teachers, the parents, there's the police who might be affected, there's the journalists, there's the health professionals, uh, and so on. And I'd love to go into all of those, but we don't really have time to do that. I'd let, just very quickly, Lynn, would you, um, I don't want to minimise it, but nobody was hurt. There were probably no major threats. What, what are you going to do? Are you going to offer something to the children or to the teachers tomorrow? Yeah, I think it would be really important. I think the, the work really begins for the school um, that next day and I, I think we we would be very grateful, I think, that um, people had ended as well as it did and people weren't weren't harmed in, in the way that they could have been. But we, we really need to, um, I guess, respect the trauma that the children have been through, the parents not knowing what's happening, the young teacher, the principal and all the community um, 
conversations that are happening, there, there's a lot of work for the school to do. And I think um, there's a lot of planning to take that into account. And I, I think some of it's around communication. And I, I think all the media and then the school's role in that, what it's like for this family, what it's like for these children coming back to school. Um, there'd be a lot of planning around that. And I think the school would really need to consult with their own media people to say, what are the messages we need to send here? How do we mm. respect the, the, the fear that was there, but also how do we respect the family and, and their privacy and their, their right, the children particularly the right to be at the school so there'd be that kind of work then there'd be the support work and identifying who are the who are the people impacted and what what needs do they have both staff and and students and not making assumptions too much we don't know how the children experience this in that classroom we don't really know what happened and there'd be a wide range of um of experiences no doubt amongst these seven-year-olds and be supporting the parents as much as the children I think so getting as much information yeah. out to parents around what might be some normal reactions um hearing listening validating um drawing on those resilient skills but they're pretty you know we're stretching them really they're not just your typical resilient skills but monitoring for a long period of time and being okay. and having support available for sure so you yeah you so you've got plenty of things planned to kind of help them through this next day um, Kate, the young reporter who did those interviews with the very distressed mothers is being vilified on social media. They are uh, calling her a vulture. They're saying she's exploiting people's grief. There are vile um, things said about her. In fact, there's even threats of a sexual nature uh, against her. Uh, is this unusual for a journalist to be sort of trolled like this after reporting something? Not at all. It's uh, completely typical. It's what's happening now, especially for women journalists. Um, but in this case, Mark, we also know that WBC were also there doing fabulous and important reporting, the Windsor Broadcasting Corporation. Mm. Uh, and so I did link this journalist up with uh, some of the journalists from WBC um, because they've been doing some great coverage on, uh, the, on mental health and family violence. And in fact, they've been speaking to some of Lynn's folks uh, and the school and the media have been working together, which is a really important thing to be a collaborator with the media um, because the media has a really important role in these sorts of stories of educating the community and helping the community understand, but also feel safe again. So I linked this journalist that has been vilified, and that is very typical, up with one of the WBC peer support journalists uh, trained because WBC had us in there doing uh, psychoeducation. Um, well, and, uh, yeah, go on. That's great. That is great um, to hear. She kind of feels that she needs a bit more. She's heard about the Dart Foundation for Journalists and Trauma. She heard about the local branch, the Dart Centre Australia Pacific. And so she contacts you through them. Are you able to put her in touch with someone who can help her, perhaps a therapist or someone if she needs it? Absolutely. So what I'd be doing is talking about uh, talking with her about her needs and what she would like. Would she like to see a therapist? Would she like to see what sort of person would she like to see and talk through the options with her? And then I would be able to link her up with some appropriate therapists if that's the path that she wanted to go down. Uh, she, at first, she wanted to speak to a peer supporter, but then she found that that sort of lived its life. Um, and so she was wanting some more clinical sort of support. She was, I believe, she was having some nightmares and, and the trolling was really taking its toll. So I linked her up with uh, a good clinical psychologist who sees quite a few journalists uh, in the area. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, May, I've got literally 30 seconds if you would like to make a very quick comment. Look, I just wanted to also just make a further comment that this is a really tragic situation, but also that often sometimes you see these um, experiences of um, retaliatory abuse and violence on one partner because they may feel fearful about a response from the other partner. So it can actually seem that the person who does the act of abuse and violence is the aggressor, but it might be a bit confusing in the situation because she might actually be responding in a fear response because she feels the kids are being taken away and there's a coercive event. So it's actually quite complicated in terms of how DV might actually be playing out in this setting. So I just wanted to make that clear because it wasn't, it's not always obvious. And the media portrayal is going to be of her as the aggressor, whereas it might not actually be the situation. And she might be living with that ongoing um, secondary trauma of then seeing her name in the media 
subsequently from all absolutely. of these people as well. Absolutely, absolutely, which would be pretty bad for any of us, let alone if we're struggling already. Thank you for that, May. Hmm. Well, look, as you know, our society is obsessed with real life crime. And sure enough, within a week of the incident happening, the first episode of the podcast serial has already hit the airwaves. You can get it from uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Netflix is going to rush out a docudrama. They've already signed Nicole Kidman to pay, play Jody and Russell Crowe to play Jim. Both of them are 30 years too old, but never mind, they're crowd pullers, so they've signed them up. But I'm afraid I'm contractually bound not to reveal the names of the actors who are going to portray our panel members. So you'll just have to speculate on who they might be, but I know I'm going to be glued to that Netflix special. In the meantime, we have to leave the suburb of Williamsville in the state of Windsor. We have to leave the Robinson family, but we will keep our fingers firmly crossed for Jim and Jody, as well as the twins, Shane and Matilda. And I think we can be reasonably confident that they're in very good hands with their GP, May, and their uh, psychiatrist, Andrew, not to mention the support they're getting at the school through, uh, through Lynn and her colleagues. So for now, I'd like you to join me in thanking our magnificent panelists, uh, Lynn O'Grady, Mick Elliott, May Sue, Andrew Channon, and Kate McMahon. I can hear the applause resounding through cyberspace across Australia. The panel were magnificent. Thank you so much indeed. It was wonderful. Uh, can I say thank you also to JT Productions uh, for the tech stuff? Thank you also to MHPN for organizing this hypothetical. And most importantly, thank you very much to all of you for joining us for this live event and for those of you who are watching us later on a recording. And I just hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have. We've had a lot of fun, so I hope you have too. Keep an eye on the MHPN website for the next hypothetical, which is scheduled, I think, for May 2024. And... Um, Please complete the survey. I know it's a pain, but if you can complete the survey, it's really important for us to know what you thought of tonight's hypothetical and what we could perhaps do better. But at that point, that's all from me. Thank you very much again to everybody and bye for now.